If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites according to a recent Indeed survey. With Indeed, everything hiring is all in one place and it makes it so easy. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences each each day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. The more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join the more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash podcast. Just go to Indeed.com slash podcast right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Terms and conditions apply. Indeed.com slash podcast. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to Sugar Coated Murder Podcast, a brilliant true crime podcast hosted by two zany sisters, all while baking up delicious treats in their kitchen. Here are your podcast hosts, Karen Devaney and Ann Varner. Varner, Karen, Beanie. Here we are. Oh my gosh, it's us. It's they were us. just talking about us. It's us. The people. It's the people. The voices. Crazy. Yeah, the voices. There were voices. There were voices. Very professional voices. Yes. Yeah, so I'd like to thank you. <coughs> so sorry, I'm clearing my throat because my allergies are not going well. You got allergies. I got the allergies. I'm sorry. Me too. So, in case anybody didn't catch the beginning of this. We There's got a new intro. Something new going on. <laughs> yes, and I'm going to let you do all the thank yous and shout outs. All right, well, I'm sure this won't be the last time because I feel like it's a lifetime of thank yous that we owe. Oh, we'll never, we'll never be able to repay this. I know. To um, our friend Michael from the real country 101.7 out of franklin virginia that would be w l q m f m or j w j z u a m sorry i probably didn't do that justice but um michael owns the radio station and the voice behind the intro is yes. jared jared one yes. of the announcers there at the radio station and they did that it's a gift. They did. They gifted that a to gift. us. Yes. I mean, that was so special that they would go and give us their talent. I know. So sweet and so special. And I, I kind of feel professional now. It's I know. crazy. They murdered it. I they, mean, they slayed it. They killed it. They <laughs> slayed it. They, they made us sound professional. Exactly. So thanks, guys, for doing that. Yeah, we really we appreciate, appreciate it. it. Definitely. So here we are we're, in we're the here. kitchen in with our Sugar Coated Murder podcast, okay. talking about murder and also baking. Yes. Oh, my God. You're going to love this recipe this week. This is a little bit crazy for me. I, and I hope it works because if it does, it's going on the Thanksgiving menu. I'll tell you what happened. I was walking through the grocery store. And a box of Little Debbie pecan spin wheels popped off the shelf onto the floor. And I said, what the hell? What the hell? So I picked it up. And I said, nice. well, I like a spin wheel. Mm-hmm. They used to be my favorite as a kid. Mm-hmm. Remember when we would try to see if we could unwind them all in one piece? Yeah. And the very best part is the centerpiece. Yes. Well, guess what Little Debbie did? Hmm. Little Debbie came up with some freaking recipes on her boxes that now. That is unbelievable. Way to go, Little Debbie. I can't get up. Now I'm going to have to go and look at all the Little Debbie products and see if there are other recipes on other products. Well, there are. <gasps> Shut up. I know. Shut up Enjoy right dessert now. anytime with Little Debbie. Little Debbie. Little Debbie. Little. So, this is a recipe for a pecan spin wheel bread freaking shut pudding. Up. Shut your mouth. I won't. That I is not, crazy. I will not shut my mouth. That is the craziest thing. I know. You literally take the contents of the Little Debbie Spin Wheels box, <laughs> open them up, cut them into quarters. Okay. You put them into... Try not to eat them. Right. Some milk, eggs, brown sugar, vanilla, um, a little bit of salt, 
This called for raisins and cranberries. Oh, no, blah, we don't do that. Why would I do that? <laughs> uh, nutmeg and cinnamon. Mm. You mix it together. You let it soak in all the goodness. And then you put it into some muffin tins. Which I love that because now pan. you each get your own. Little individuals. Um, you're going to want to spray the bottom of those muffin cups and then put your mixture in. And then so you lined your, you took your muffin pan and lined it with the paper liners. Oh, yeah. And then sprayed the paper liners. Yeah, I don't okay. think you'll be able to get a good bread pudding out. I think so. Uh, I think it'd be too sticky. Yeah, you're going to need a liner. Yeah. And we'll let you know how it goes. We may be wrong. It may turn out that we say, oh, you know what would be better is a piece of parchment paper at the bottom. Right. So we'll we'll see. We'll test it. Never made this before. I know. That's what we do here. We make things that we've never made before. It's wild and crazy in the kitchen And it's what today. we do. That's what we do here. Wild. It's crazy. And the other thing we do is talk about Marito. Are you going to tell me a story while I do this cooking? Yes. So let me tell you. A story about this story. Okay, let's hear. So I'm going to focus. The beginning of this is very hyper-focused on a particular person. And I have a lot to say about this person. And, and once I say, once I get through this story, I will let you know why it is I have so much to say about this particular person. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm going to preface this with. Mystery. I know. So um, I'm in Connecticut. Oh, all right. Yep, and connect to cut. Connect to cut. Yes. And I'm going to talk about uh, a lady, a girl or a lady. Her name is, I'm going to murder her name. Okay. She was an immigrant from another country, and I'm sure her name and her native tongue is gorgeous and beautiful and rolls right off the tongue. This American girl is going to have a hard time. Of so course. it's Dzung, uh -huh. which I know that's wrong. Nagak. Okay. Two. Ah. Okay. Miss Two. So I'm just going to call her Two. Okay. Because that's the easiest one. Yeah. Anyway, in 1981, she was a graduate student from Bethesda, Maryland, studying agriculture at Cornell University. Mm -hmm. She was known to her friends and family as smart, hardworking, very kind. She had moved with her parents and her brother from Vietnam in 1969 when she was 13 years old. Oh, wow. She was all of 5 feet tall and 95 pounds. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's her heart. Her roommate from Vassar, which is where she went to before Cornell, described her as extremely polite. She was thought of as everyone's little sister. She had a very gentle nature and small stature. And that brought out a mothering instinct in those around her. She was gentle and trusting, but had a spine of steel and was driven. She wanted to use her agriculture education that she was working on at Cornell to change the world. Oh, nice. Starting with her homeland. She wanted to take that education and economics. She had, she had studied economics at Vassar. So she wanted to take that and agriculture and take it back to Vietnam and, and help them develop better food sourcing. Oh, I love it. So she, this is the kind of girl she was. She volunteered for Big Brother, Big Sister. She sponsored orphans through the mail. Like she, she, she was just a pure gold. Pure Sounds gold. Sounds like it. My goodness. So two graduated from Walt Whitman High School with honors in 1973. And then she graduated from Vassar College in 1977. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 69, she came at 13. She went a year early. Wow. To so college. She was Very smart. bright. When she graduated from Vassar in 1977, she actually was awarded the, econo the Economic Department's Prize of Honor. Wow. In, in 1981, she was a first-year graduate student at Cornell University. She was the pride of her immediate and extended family. I read a quote from one of her friends that said when she would get picked up from school, like on breaks and stuff, when her family would come and get her, they would come in car loads. <gasps> really? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I yes. Her it. mom, her dad, her brother, her all of her extended family would just come in this caravan of cars to pick her up and take her home. That is so sweet. I mean, isn't that the best? I love it. So on the night of May 12th, 1981 she failed to return home to her rooming house and her landlady immediately called the police because she was very punctual right 
A few days later, there was a local newspaper that ran a missing persons notice with her picture stating that she had been last seen reading a newspaper in Warren Hall on campus before her evening class. Mm. You're just taking a breath. Okay. Okay. So on May 17th, her body was found in the Fall Creek Gorge. Mm. Police classified her death as a suicide. What? Yes. So there was a bridge over the gorge that was known for suicidal jumpers. Okay. And there was this nickname or term that the students on campus referred to called gorging out or to gorge out, which meant to jump off that bridge and commit suicide because that was, it happened so often, which is so sad. That is sad, but I mean, we have a completely different thought on what gorging is. I know, but this is a gorge. (laughs) This is actually a gorge, like a body of water. Two's friends were outraged at the classification of suicide. They had never seen one sign of depression. That She loved life. She loved living life. She was all about going and doing. She was very driven. She was not depressed. They really spoke out um, to police, and the police actually retracted the classification of suicide, and they started an investigation. Oh, nice. Good job, friends. The investigation goes nowhere. Oh, So, until 1984, it turns out Two was the first victim of Cornell University serial killer Michael Bruce Ross. I had no idea there was a serial killer at Cornell. Me neither. So, he confessed to police in 1984 and again in 1987 to a psychiatrist. Oh. He said he picked her up randomly. He saw her on campus. They actually had the same evening class together. That, oh. So it, it's not clear if, if it was before or after class that this happened. But he saw her. I guess maybe it was after class because he said he got in his car and he watched her as she was walking along the sidewalk from campus. And it was an evening class. It was nighttime. Not a lot of people around. Right. So he jumped out of his car and pushed her into the bushes. And he actually pushed her in and attacked her, raped her, strangled her, and killed her. And then he picked up her little body, and he took it to a lake nearby in, like, the backside of campus. Right. And put her body in the lake. But what happened was that lake runs into a waterfall that drops into the gorge. So police say that he put her in the lake, but she actually, her body went down that waterfall and into the gorge. When they found her, her body was very beaten up. I'm sure. Yes. God. He had been entertaining, Ross had been entertaining rape fantasies for a very long time in his night. And on that night, when he saw two, he just decided to act on it. Wow. He stated he was able to subdue, subdue her and then rape her and kill her on campus. Jeez. Right there in the bushes. So, two was the first of eight victims of Ross, Michael Ross. She is referred to by family and friends as the forgotten victim. He was not even prosecuted for her death. What? So, and that's why I concentrated on her the most because her family didn't even realize that her death had become a mystery. They got a phone call, said she was dead, they thought it was suicide. And they said they didn't hear again that it had ever even been opened as a murder investigation or anything until this man was picked up and confessed to her murder. Wow. Years and years later. That is crazy. Right. And then he wasn't even convict charged. He wasn't convicted or prosecuted for her murder. That is insane. So they always feel like she was the forgotten one. Of course. So now I'm going to run down his other seven victims. He had eight total victims. Holy cow. Okay, Tammy Williams. January of 1982, she was 17 years old. She was abducted in Brooklyn, Connecticut by Ross as she was walking home from her boyfriend's house. Did I even say that right? You did. I didn't. You said boyfriend. 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 Walking home from her boyfriend's house. I'm going to enunciate and I'm not drinking. I'm really drinking water. I like boyfriend. Boyfriend. (laughs) It's her boyfriend. Her boyfriend. She is remembered as a bubbly, bright, normal teenager that enjoyed laughing with friends, playing pool, listening to music. 
She was abducted, raped, and strangled to death by Ross. <gasps> she actually was familiar with Ross, and she knew his family because this was his hometown. Oh, my gosh. Ross also was not prosecuted for her demise, but he confessed to it. Jeez. The next victim is Paula. I'm going to screw this up. Pereira. That's what I'm saying. It's Pereira. It's P-E-R-R-E-R-A. Okay. Pereira. That sounds right to me. Okay. I probably would go with that. She's from Middletown, New York, and she was 16 years old in March of 1982. So this was just, Tammy Williams was January. This is March. Wow. Ross picked her up as she was hitchhiking, as she often did, into town from her country home. She had a sense of adventure. She was trusting, but her friend said she would never have accepted a ride from a creepy person. Right. Well, creepy people don't look, look creepy. They just look normal. And this guy looks completely normal. Yeah. She is remembered for her dimply smile, her curly blonde hair, her blue eyes, and her love of music. Aww. Ross picked her up on his way from his hometown to Cornell. He was just like back and forth as a college yeah, student. Yeah, it sounds like he's doing his thing. Raped and strangled her on the side of the road and dumped her body. Hopped back into his car, got on Highway 85, and headed back to Cornell. Wow. To class. Yep. He also was not prosecuted for the attack and killing of Paula. Too many crickets. So now we have Deborah Taylor in June of 82. So we went January, March, and now June. He's very busy. She's from Griswold, New York. Deborah and her husband, she was 23, had run out of gas on the interstate. They split up and went looking for gas separately on oh, foot. Oh, golly. Ross kidnapped her, raped her, strangled her, and dumped her body off the road. Mm. It took four months to find her body. Oh, my gosh. Ross was also not prosecuted for her attack or murder. <sighs> So these victims that I've just described to you from 1982 are considered the footnote victims of Ross because oh. they appear in the footnotes of, oh, yeah, he also did this. Wow. But the, he was not prosecuted for them. That's crazy. Right. And so I want to pause and say just because he was not prosecuted and convicted of their murder does not make their murder any less horrible, doesn't make their death any less terrifying. Of course not. These, these women were in his path, and that's the only thing that, that got them dead. Right. I mean, it's, it's wrong crazy. Wrong place, wrong time. Well, and it wasn't even the wrong place. It was just bad timing for them to be where they were. Right. But I just feel like those victims should be more than a freaking footnote. Yeah, I agree. Sorry. I just, and I almost said the real F word, but mama, I'm trying so hard. <laughs> So next I'm going to talk about Robin Stravinsky. She was from Norwich, Connecticut. She was 19 years old in November of 1983. So he took a little break from June of 82 to November of 83. Don't know why. Maybe he got the chicken pox or something. Yeah, yeah. or maybe he got a chigger. I don't know. <laughs> from all his, you know, activity in the woods. Yes. So she disappeared while hitchhiking. And a week later, joggers found her body. She had been raped and strangled. Police were able to link her case to Tammy Williams and Deborah Taylor because they all were similar in stature, petite, around five feet. Ugh. And all three had been sodomized oh. and were found face down, which is, which is unusual, and had been strangled. Right. So now we've, we've said, oh, well, there's this Deborah Taylor and this Tammy Williams. So they do, exact, they do at least connect those two attacks. Right. But still, we, we didn't connect it to Paula, and we didn't connect it to... Two. To two. Two, two. To two, two. <laughs> so next we have April, Brunia, and Leslie Shelley. They were both 14 years old, and they were, they were friends. On Easter Sunday in April of 1984, they were walking home together from the movies in Griswold, New York. Hmm. Ross kidnapped both of them off the street, subdued them in his car, tied them up in his car, took them down to a lake where he took one out of the car mm -hmm. and raped and strangled her pretty much while the other one watched. And 
dumped her in the lake and then came back. Oh my gosh. Took the other girl out of the car and raped and strangled her to death as well. But he said it was really irritating because she didn't struggle. She just accepted it. And so it really pissed him off because he said, I almost didn't get any satisfaction from that one. Mm. Because he got a rush from the fear and the struggling. And she didn't struggle. And he, he was really irritated. Oh, there is a place in hell just for him. I can only hope so. <laughs> so when investigators found their remains, they had been attacked and killed in, the, in similar manner as Stravinsky, Taylor, and Williams. Okay. So now we're going to go to Wendy... I'm going to screw this up. Bear a bolt. Oh. That's all I can say. It's bear a bolt. Bear a bolt. Why are you looking at me? Are you uh-huh. looking at me? Okay. No. My glasses are not very um, clean, so yeah. when I when I look through them, it's... Do you need help? Do you, you want not, me to give them a wash? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Be oh, happy. no, you can't do that. I can't read. Oh, that's right. So, Wendy was 17 years old, and she was from Lisbon, Connecticut. On June 13th of 1984, she was walking to a local convenience store. Uh-huh. She was last seen walking down Highway 12, and witnesses noticed that she was being followed by a man driving a blue Toyota. Oh, God. Here's my thing, people. What? If you see a girl alone, and she's walking down the street, and then you see this Toyota or this car that's kind of following behind her very slowly, why don't you stop? Why don't you just stop? Right. Just stop. Hey, how about run into his car? Or just pull in front of him and go, oh, my God, I'm so sorry, and now my car won't start. Right. Do something, but don't wait until it's too late, and then you're the witness. Right. So she disappears, and her body was found several days later. She also had been raped and strangled to death the same way as the others. My God. Found face down, the whole M.O. So, but at this point, police are able to actually hone in on this man in the blue Toyota. Okay. And through some investigative gumshoe work, they <laughs> figure out it must be 27-year-old Michael Bruce Ross. All right. So, Wendy was Ross's last victim. Thank God. I know. So, when police question Ross, he just confesses to all of it. Yeah, because he, he enjoyed it. It was his thing. He confessed to Wendy, and he was like, oh, by the way, there was this lady that I started with in Connecticut. I mean, he actually started way back when he was young and got in trouble because there were two younger girls. They were in grade school, and he lured them into the bathroom and then made them take their clothes off. He said, I didn't do anything, but I got in trouble. I didn't do anything. You made them what? take their clothes off, you idiot. God. So, Yeah. So anyway, and then he just confesses to the whole thing. I actually watched the whole entire confession. Wow. And, and did it make your stomach turn? Oh, it made it made my skin crawl. And, and was it at that point that you didn't want to do this? Story? That's when I was having trouble with it. I couldn't even write the first thing on the piece of paper. I couldn't. I was just like, how am I going to do this? Right. And then as I was falling asleep last night, Miss Two reached out to me and said, I'm the forgotten victim. Please don't let me stay forgotten. Aww. And so I woke up this morning, got a cup of coffee, and just started writing. And there and you go. And it just all came out. Right. So, okay, so I, I watched a show called Signs of a Psychopath. It's on Discovery Plus. I'm sure at one time it was on ID Discovery. It might still be there. That's when he they showed his confession and all that kind of stuff. They talked about him. And they had a couple of... That is kind of the nice thing about watching those shows is to see the video of investigations yeah. and confessions. Yeah. It's not good, but it, it does yeah. give you a sense of who you're talking about. Yeah, it does. So I had decided to do this serial killer because I had no idea. I kept researching something else. I came across him and was like, I had no idea there was a Cornell University serial killer in Connecticut of all places. I had no idea. So I started, and I had like 10 articles that I read about him. Right. There's so many articles about him. It's not even funny because of what he went through in the justice system, which I'll get to. So eventually it all became about him. Right. And then when I read this one article last night before I went to bed, and it was, a, it was actually a statement from her brother mm-hmm. that said, Nobody knows anything about her because the police never bothered to get to know her. 
And he said she is the forgotten victim. And he actually went to the prison where Ross was. Wow. So anyway, he is tried and convicted of the last four murders. He gets several death penalties for that. Right. Yeah, actually, it was six capital offenses because of the kidnappings, the rapes, and the murders, the way that they did it. So he's given the death penalty. He actually had asked for the death penalty. Oh, well, yes. give the man what he wants. And he actually tried several times to stop the appeals process <laughs> because you automat- it automatically goes into this appeals process right. and you've got these lawyers that just take the ball and run with it. And right. he tried several times to say, no, yeah, I don't you. want it. Several times he was interviewed by psychiatrists to determine his mental stability. He was always found to be stable, but a psychopath. Yeah. So um, Ross's own father at one point even uh, filed an appeal on Ross's behalf without Ross's permission, saying due to diminished mental capacity, he should not be put to death. Because, you know, in America, you can be completely sane and create havoc and do all these horrible things and get the death penalty, but by the time it's time for us, if you are diminished mental capacity, we don't do it. No, we do not. So, and at that point, Ross actually wrote the courts asking them to reject any appeal that was not filed by him personally or his one and only attorney. Hmm. That's it. So, eventually, the appealing circus stopped. Okay. I will tell you that the first image of that you get of Ross when you watch this this show. Right. The first image of him is he comes in to sit down to be interviewed because he actually was interviewed in prison. So I watched the confession, but it's also him being interviewed in prison. Oh, later. wow. Yeah. Interesting. And the first thing he does is he laughs. He has this giggle and he laughs and says, I'm Michael Ross. I'm Connecticut's most heinous killer. And oh. laughs. Oh, no. It, he just is. He has no, and he even says, I guess I just don't have a conscience because none of it bothered me. Wow. Oh, my God. He's very candid about how evil he was. He said there was nothing those victims could have done. As a matter of fact, he said it wasn't about them. It was about me. And as soon as I saw them, they were pretty much dead. Right. It was all about getting his satisfaction. Yes. And dominating. And So there was a forensic psychologist that um, actually referred to his mask of sanity. And his mask of sanity was being personable and this all-around nice guy that hid this perverse, depraved evil. Ugh. And he, you know, even when they picked him up, he had, like, these big wire rim glasses. He was in a white button-down shirt and a blazer and khakis. Like, he looked like he was strolling along the Cornell University. I mean, just what you would expect right. for a graduate student at one of these nice, smarticle, you know, smarticle, smarticle schools. Yes. So, um, and he was, you know, highly intelligent. So he actually talked about how death row was supposed to be punishment. He said, but it's the living that's punishment for people like me. And that's why he wanted the death penalty. Oh. Because he knew he was a monster. Right. It didn't bother him to be a monster. He just knew. And when they said, do you think that you would do it again? He was like, well, I, I am a rabid monster, so probably. Yeah. Ugh. So in 2005, he was actually um, executed by yes. lethal injection. Yay! Yes. And, That's really good news. And whereas the families of the victims he was convicted of killing were allowed to go in and sit and watch the execution, Two's brother went to, but he wasn't allowed to go in Ugh. because he wasn't, she was a, she was a forgotten victim. I would have... He did get invited to come into a room in the prison... And wait until the announcement. At first, he was just standing outside, and somebody saw him. I guess he got interviewed by a, one of the news people that were covering it, and then somebody actually came and got him and let him go inside the building so he didn't have to be outside. He went there on behalf of his parents. Right. Um, by then, his parents had moved back to Vietnam. They were broken. I'm sure. They were broken. I, why would you want to be here? Why would you want to be here? That happened to your child, and then she got... Just swept under the rug. Right. Yeah, it's very sad. But he just said, you know, I want people to know that before this, this, her life was not about her, how she died. Right. She had an incredible life. And she was the absolute prize to my parents, to me, everybody. We, she was like the golden child. And she lived life to the fullest. And she was smart and funny and fun. And she gave all of herself to everybody she ever met. 
And he said, that's how I want her remembered, but I at least want her remembered. Of course. So, and that gives me chills just thinking about it. Yeah. So, anyway, that's my story of Dzong Nagak 2. I mean, I think that's her name. Dzong, Dzong. I like that we call her 2. I like 2. T-U. 2. Yeah. That smells amazing in there. It doesn't it? Like, oh my it's God. Happening. I feel like I'm at a coffee shop. I know. And they're pulling something really amazing out of the yeah, oven. Yeah, because you put this mixture, and by the way, I totally did something wrong because you're supposed to divide <laughs> it evenly between 12 cups. And it didn't work. And I only got to eight. Whatever. So we like a generous I portion. I just took the liners out of the other three, put a little water in it, and yep. stuck it in because yeah. whatever. Whatever. But just before you put it in the oven, you drizzle melted butter over each no. little thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my oh God. God. This is going to be so I good. I know. I'm so well, excited. guys, before we started recording tonight, my sister made me pizza, and it was so delicious. I'm telling you, this is just, I feel like I'm at a restaurant right now. Oh, sweet. <laughs> so, yep. Well, we got, we, we've watched a friend of ours make the pizza a couple of times, and he lives far away, so he can't be around to make it for us whenever we want. No. So, um, I watched very, very carefully yes, the you last did. time we were there. And you nailed it. And got all the ingredients, mm -hmm. You've paid you've attention really... to everything, and now I think I've mastered the recipe. I feel like you've mastered it. Yeah, it's really good. And I got to tell you, you had just the right ratio of it. You, you piled the stuff on tonight, but it was the perfect ratio to everything. It wasn't overly sauce. Oh, good. So, I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, you don't put a lot of sauce on. Mm -mm. Um, it was so, super good. Yeah. Super good. And now I've got this that's cooking and, and now, wafting. Yeah, it's and... like a whole wonderful situation you, happening like... in Ann Varner's kitchen tonight. Seriously. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. So we've got about 10 minutes left on the bread pudding. Okay. If you want to pause it, I'll get my stuff together because I also got a true crime murder story That's so to talk exciting. About. I love that you brought your own murder to the party. I did. I did. All right. <laughs> hold on, y'all. Hello. We're back. We're back. Can't get rid of us that easily. My, my house smells so gosh darn good. Oh, my God. It really does. It yeah. smells delightful. It smells it's, good. They're it's hysterical. Setting off fireworks. From, so. It sounds like in a war zone because they're setting fireworks off outside. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of big kabooms going. Yeah. But your dog seems to be okay. He's seems watching he's, the, the blank television. He's right handling now. things. He's handling it right now. He's handling yeah. it. So we're just going to let that ride. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I have a story. I can't wait to hear it. I know. It was a dark and stormy night. Oh, um, I love a dark and it stormy. It was a dark and stormy. <laughs> I love a dark and stormy. <laughs> June 3rd, 2007. A row of cluster storms was rolling through Bryan, Texas. That's where we are this week. Bryan, Texas. Okay. With thunder so loud, it was setting off home alarm systems in the area. Most of the homeowners were able to reset their systems, but one continued to blare. Hazel Ogden got a call from her best friend's alarm company at around midnight. The company was showing that Etta Jean Westbrook's Etta home... Jean? Etta Jean. Oh, love that name. I know. Etta Jean Westbrook's home alarm system was going off, and the company couldn't reach Etta Jean. So Hazel asked the alarm company to send the police. She met the police officer at Etta Jean's. He checked the doors and told Hazel that the house was secure. Hazel told the officer she thought there was something wrong with her friend because there was a light on inside and the car was in the driveway. The officer shined his light around, didn't see anything. Um, he shines the light into the kitchen window and Hazel spots some uncooked food on the counter. I believe oh. it was some chicken. Oh, dear. Hazel talked the officer into entering the house. I'm sorry, I'm reading... <laughs> I have to say I autocorrect when I was typing my notes because once I said Hazel saw the uncooked food on the counter, then I wrote, knowing that Etta Jean kept an emasculate house. Oh, God, not an, house. not an emasculate house, but an immaculate house <laughs> <laughs> and would never leave raw chicken on the counter. Then Hazel was able to talk the officer into entering the house. Okay. Thank goodness. The back door was unlocked. They walked into the house, and they found poor Etta Jean dead on the living room floor. Aww. There was a large laceration on her head, and her hair was soaked with blood. There did not appear to be a lot of blood at the scene, so they were thinking maybe she fell and hit her head. They did find some flecks of rust or something like it on the carpet and close to her body, but 
they collected it and felt like, you know, maybe it's just dirt or whatever. And of yeah. course, Hazel's like, mm mm. And a jean keeps her house she, clean. That girl, she she vacuums twice yeah, a day. This that would be that would be something weird. She emasculates her car. She every emasculates day. it every day. <laughs> Within a couple of hours of learning of his mother's murder, Etta Jean's son Curtis arrived at her house to walk through with the police and see if anything was missing. There were cleaning products, including bleach on the back porch. Nothing major was missing from the house, but they did find Etta Jean's pocketbook also known as a purse, <laughs> in the guest bedroom, which was odd. Oh. Curtis noted that Etta Jean's credit cards were missing and saw there was no cash in her wallet, which, again, was odd. Hmm. When Etta Jean's other son, Randy, arrived, he looked around and told police that the object used to hold the kiln door of, in Etta Jean's garage um, open, she had a pottery kiln in her garage oh, because wow. she was an artiste. She enjoyed pottery and painting and you know do all kinds of things. But so fun. the kiln the kiln lid wouldn't stay up on its own. It was broken. So she was using an old railroad spike that her husband had in his garage. I bet it was rusty. And it, it was indeed rusty. Hmm. Uh, but it was missing. Really? It, it was missing. But there was another one in the garage that Randy showed the police and said, This is what it looks uh, like. Okay. This is what yeah, so the police have Etta Jean's body removed from the house and sent to the medical exam to determine her cause of death. Now, there was a lot of blood when they moved her body, oh, okay. but it was odd because there was no blood like anywhere no, else. No spatter. No. That's weird. Very odd. So, Randy starts canvassing the neighborhood to see if anything had seen anything. anything, to see if anybody if any had seen. had been happening by. And there's a lot of A's here. <laughs> To, to see if anybody had seen anything out of the norm in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. He sees a fella pulling up in the neighbor Geraldine's driveway, and he decides to go over and see if Geraldine's home. So we have Hazel. Yes. We have Etta Jean. Yes. And we have Geraldine. That is correct. I love this. Right. They're, they're older ladies. I love them. Looking out for each other in this yes. neighborhood. When Randy went over to Geraldine's driveway, the fellow, and asked the fella, is Geraldine home? He said, no, Geraldine's traveling. And Randy thought that was kind of weird because Geraldine wasn't one to leave home. Yeah. She's not, she's not a traveler. She was a stay at home kind of, kind of lady. Yeah. But the guy introduced himself as Christian Olson. Um, he said that he was, at a, uh, not at a gene, was Geraldine's daughter, Kelly's boyfriend. And he got Randy's number and said he'd call him if he saw anything weird yeah. the night, you know, in the neighborhood. In the meantime, investigators start digging into Etta Jean's case. They go back into the house and they use luminol to see if anything turned up. Well, that living room lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, wow. They start tracking Etta Jean's stolen credit cards and see that both of them had been used starting at 2.15 the Sunday that Etta Jean was murdered. Transactions appeared at Target, Walmart, and a store called H-E-B, which I am not familiar with. It's the initials H-E-B. I've heard of it. Um, I don't know what that... If it's, it's like a clothing store. Oh, well, there you go. Store. Heb. They went to Heb. Police go in and get surveillance video because all the transactions happened between 2.15 and 8 o'clock. So it wasn't a very big window. No, they were busy. They were busy. Um, and the charges were less than $1,500. So it wasn't like a, a huge, they weren't yeah. making big, huge purchases, but they were doing okay were between Walmart, Target, and Heb. Okay. So they go back and look at the surveillance video, and lo and behold, there's this Christian Olson mm -hmm. who has introduced himself as oh. Geraldine's oh. Mm -hmm. daughter's boyfriend. Yeah. And Geraldine's daughter's name is Kelly. I don't, and I'm not going to do well with this name, but it looks to be Sifuentes. Okay. S I F U E N T E Z. Sifuentes. I'll take it. They go back and they they see the two of them at these stores buying stuff with Etta Jean's credit card. So of course the police go and pick up old Christian and his girlfriend Kelly. Kelly. And they take him down to the police I don't think station. Christian is very Christian. It, 
apparently not so much. No, he doesn't seem to be. And they, they put him in separate interview rooms. Good. Christian says, yeah, we used Etta Jean's credit cards, but I didn't do any, I didn't kill her. I did not murder her. I found her credit cards at a park near her house, and then I used them. And in the meantime, Kelly's in another room saying, I can't believe he would steal this woman's credit cards. I just didn't know he had it in him. And the, the investigator's like, well, you didn't know he was using a stolen credit card. She said, no, I didn't see whose name was on the credit card when he was buying that stuff. Oh. You didn't think it was strange that he was suddenly came into some money? And what, she said, no, not at all. Okay. Yeah. Well, back into Christian's room, the investigator said, we don't believe your story. We call bullshit. Mm-hmm. And Christian said, well, you're right. I did it. <laughs> I didn't take him a oh, whole lot. He, like a he, deck of cards. he did indeed. <laughs> he certainly did. Oh my God. He said he saw Etta Jean come home from church around noon on Sunday, and he went to her house to return a pen that he had borrowed. As he entered, he stopped and grabbed the railroad spike from the garage and hit it behind his back. He hit Etta Jean with the spike, stole the cash, credit cards, and he went to the store with Kelly, got some cleaning products, went back and cleaned the crime scene. Oh, oh. All right. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, Miss Kelly. I didn't even, I, I can't believe, I can't believe he, he would steal some credit cards. Not only that. But, but in, I did clean up some blood. <laughs> in the interview, she also said um, he, that he was a friend of her daughter's. He was a oh. friend of her daughter's. Oh, no, I thought so keep that boyfriend, girlfriend. Keep that in mind. Okay. Keep that in mind, okay? You're going to get more on that topic. Well, he's a friend. He, her boyfriend is a friend of her daughter's. She didn't call him her oh. boyfriend. She said he is a friend. He's living at the house with us, and he is a oh. friend of my daughter. he daughter's. introduced himself as Kelly's boyfriend. Correct. Okay, this should be interesting. Correct. Correct. According to the medical examiner's report, Christian hit 68-year-old Etta Jean in the head 25 <gasps> times with the rusty railroad oh spike. God. In addition... He strangled her with such force that he crushed her voice box. Christian said that he threw the spike and bloody clothes into a trash bin, but police never could find anything that he threw out. But they did find Etta Jean's wallet at Geraldine's house. Where's Geraldine? Christian Olson was charged with capital murder. In 2009, he was found guilty and was sentenced to death. It is important to know... That Christian Olsen was 19 when he murdered Etta Jean. His girlfriend, Kelly Sifuentes, was in her 30s at the time of the murder. Oh. Christian dated Kelly's daughter when he was 14. Uh-huh. After they broke up, he and Kelly started oh. a sexual relationship and stayed together ever since. Once Christian oh, turned 18, he moved into Geraldine's house with Kelly. Where's Geraldine? So... Christian appealed his sentencing case, the sentencing case, not that he was guilty, but the death penalty part. He just part. didn't like the... He didn't, he didn't want to die. Yeah, he was like, I did it, but I mean, I they don't, die. don't don't punish me for right. it. Right, right, right. God. He appeals that case in 2012 because he said the judge in his case would not allow testimony from an expert who said that Christian had been sexually abused by Kelly and that she had groomed him and talked him into killing Etta Jean. Oh. The appeals court agreed that <gasps> jurors should have heard the testimony and in an eight-to-one vote overturned his punishment, not the conviction, okay, but, just the punishment. Okay, so he's not, he doesn't get the death penalty. Does not get the death penalty. In 2000, February of 2016, the punishment phase of the case goes back to court. Uh-huh. But this time... The prosecutor did not seek the death penalty. Okay. And this time, Christian was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Okay. He was 19. He was 19 when he went to prison right. in 2009. Uh-huh. That's a long life. It is a no, long life parole. behind bars, right? Mm-hmm. Kelly Sifuentes was charged with soliciting to commit capital murder in the death of her mother, Geraldine Lloyd, who was found buried in her own backyard in 2007 
just months after Etta Jean was murdered. Oh, my God. Kelly and Christian had been stealing from <gasps> Geraldine, and when she caught on to them, it is suspected that Kelly talked Christian into killing her. Oh, my God. This Kelly is one hell of a woman. Well, and Kelly is has raised some interesting people, too, because evidently the adult people living in the house, one of which was her daughter, mm -hmm. knew that Christian had killed the woman and buried her in the backyard. And they just moved and right they in. And they all said, oh, agreed look. to keep quiet. Yeah, free house. Yeah, well, guess what? They were collecting Geraldine's social security. Of course they, they were. were get, they were getting yeah. money off of her. That's disgusting. It's really bad. She, the Satan spawned another Satan. It's true. Ew. They're all vermin. Right. <laughs> they are indeed. Um, Kelly confessed that she had talked Christian into murdering her mother. Christian was never tried for Geraldine's murder. Why? There was not enough evidence. Kelly was found guilty of soliciting to commit capital murder and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Six years into her sentence, at 48 years old, Kelly committed suicide by hanging herself in the prison cell. I hope it took a long time to <laughs> die. And that's one of the reasons why they did not seek the death penalty in Christian's case, because they they didn't have the yeah, other half gone. of the story. Now she's gone. So, But, I mean, life in prison without it, the possibility of parole. 19 years old, that's a long time. Yeah. It's a long time. And that's it. That's all I got. It wasn't a very long story, but it needed oh. to be told. These are just nice older ladies. That got preyed upon. That got preyed upon. Yeah. By her own daughter. Yeah. Geraldine's own daughter. Who started dating her daughter's ex-boyfriend when he was 14. There's 20 years difference between them. Well, and the daughter seemed to be okay with it. Right. That's what that was I'm like. I'm telling oh you, they're all vermin. Something bad happening in Texas. I don't Texas. know where that girl is right now, but I hope she got caught doing something bad. She in jail, too. I don't know. She I should have looked that up. I should have looked that up. She nasty. You should have looked that up. What the heck happened to that girl? I know. Because, ew. That's just, they're all gross. That's gross. We don't like them. Bad people. I know. Doing bad things. But yeah, Geraldine, she never got, nobody ever went to jail for her murder. That's which not is, fair. Why am I looking at the mic like I'm talking to people? I, I feel like you look keep looking at the computer like we're on a Zoom call. Oh, no. I was looking <laughs> at the, the mic like it was a, like a it was a person or Hi, something. Hi, like, hey, is Mike. How you doing? This is Mike. How you friend. doing? Oh, here we go. In 2009, Melissa... Was Seth Fuentes? Seth Fuentes. Oh, look at me remembering that. Seth Fuentes. I got to answer a survey question to get. Oh, I have love that to get the article. Yeah, to get the article. Um, and now Trout's gonna give me a hard time. a hard time about the whole thing. But anyway, in two thousand nine, when Melissa was twenty one. She was detained at her home and charged with two counts of forgery of a financial instrument. She remained in jail. She was on $30,000 bill. Oh, yeah. She was cashing checks and getting money out of her grandmother Geraldine's bank account. Isn't that crazy? They are gross. What a disappointment. You know, Geraldine, when she died, she thought, y'all are all... Y'all all suck. Oh, my gosh. And she testified against her mother in court when <laughs> when her mother went to court. Isn't that something? Oh, my God. Isn't yeah. that something? Bunch of bad apples on that bushel. Mm. I'm trying to see if there was any follow-up on Melissa. Melissa. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not exactly sure where she's leaning, but I hope that she has found... Jesus in her life and has become a really great person. And if and she hasn't, then... She takes care of homeless people. Yeah, exactly. Sadly, it was Kelly's ex-husband that tuned... No, what is the word? Clued. Clued. No. That's Clued. a good one. Yeah, I'll take that one. Okay. I'll take Clued for 25 <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Alex? $25 for giving you Clued? No. Oh, dang. They Clued... He's the oh my god! I, this is he what told, happened when I don't he told, drink. He, he told. told the police. 
He called in as an anonymous tip and told the police oh. that they needed to look in the backyard that Geraldine was buried oh my in the backyard. Gosh. So he must have gotten wind of it maybe from his daughter. I do not know. Who knows? I do I not know, but somehow they were able to find thank goodness they found yeah. Geraldine. I don't know, bless her little heart. Nobody even knew she was gone. Oh gosh. I feel like there need to be more Geraldines and Etta Jeans and Hazels in the world. Those are the best know, names. I love them. Oh, and you know, they were probably good neighbors to each other. Church going ladies. Church going sisterhood right there. Yeah. Looking out for each other. And these dumbass kids. These vermin. Sucking off the teats of. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Church going in. Oh, these sweet Come ladies. On. That is just stop, not, stop it. Stop sucking off the teats of the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> it's making me mad. It makes me mad too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can we please eat? Yes. Oh, it just smells so good. Look, I've got it on our plate. Yes. Here, I've got the fancy, yeah. the fancy <laughs> whipped cream. Let me I gotta use my teeth to get uh, the yeah, the little thing. The plastic. I think they make that easier. Yeah, but I didn't even get cool whip. I got the ready no, whip. I appreciate it. Appreciate what you do. And I didn't I'm take make a picture of it as soon as you spray some cool whip on it. I'm gonna take a picture. I didn't take the do the heavy cream in the no. in the jar and shake it up. No, I didn't. I, this one no. does not call for that sugar. Oh, and that pretty. I hope y'all can hear that. Now I'm sure you can top this with whatever you want, but I decided to do ready whip because after a long work week, I'm tired, y'all. I'm tired. tired. And honestly, my tummy can't take that ice cream. No, <laughs> no. Sugar can't do the dairy anymore. I she's just, not good with the dairy. Oh, I got old real quick, y'all. She's not, she not good with uh, any kind of a leaf at all. No, don't give me any leaves. What else is Oh, peanut butter. I can't she, do peanut butter. She can't butter. do peanut butter anymore. But I can eat a peanut. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. But anyway, let's do All right, we're going to taste sugar. this um, pecan swirl bread pudding. Mm-mm-mm. Mm. That's some good stuff oh, right there. Good. That's amazing. You just elevated a pecan twirl. I did. That is so I fun. took a little Debbie to a whole new level. I mean, you really did. Mm-hmm. Girl. That's just crazy. I could go with a caramel sauce on mm. it. You, you could do, do a bourbon car today. caramel sauce. Caramel. <laughs> caramel. You, you could definitely do a bourbon. Oh, yeah. A bourbon. Something. Just on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a bourbon on it. Or with it. Whatever. Mm. Whatever you need. Mm. Uh, I will tell you that the little muffin liners worked fine. They did. I would just recommend that you take it out of the liner before you... Try to eat it. Mine got a little soggy and I had a little taste of one. <laughs> I mean, it's some fiber. I hope I'm okay with it. Sorry that I didn't take it out promptly enough for you, sugar. Yeah, I don't know why you didn't serve it. I, I was busy talking about murders. I know. One MG. murder that turned out one word. <laughs> one murder. What is the matter with me? We're not drinking. No, mm -hmm. that's it. We're not drinking. It's a crime against nature. <laughs> Who we need to shout out to today? I don't even know. Well, we went by and saw Farmer Katie today. We did, and we got some honey. At the Growing Minds Farm. farm. Yes. Uh, and don't put the in front of it. I always do that. It's Growing, Growing Minds. Minds Farm and in Mount Pleasant, and she has really good honey, and her bees have been very busy. Busy bees. And we got some good honey. Yeah, we got to pet her goats. Mm, we're good. Willie, Billy, and Tina. We took them some squash. Yeah, we did. Got them chopped up a little raw squash and took it over. Yeah. Uh, they didn't really enjoy it, but it seemed like the chickens did. The chickens did. And well, no, Billy, no, Willie enjoyed the squash. He ate a lot of squash. Oh, did he mm -hmm. eat it? Okay. Only hand fed, though. Oh, he wouldn't well, just pick it up off the ground. No. Yes, but, and then Jake, I don't know if he thought they were balls, like tennis balls, because <laughs> he would pick them up and then go put them. <laughs> and run with them. Yeah. Like he got a prize. And, and then, then drop, drop it. it. He didn't eat it. Mm -mm. But then the chickens would all run over there, look and see what he dropped. Exactly. And they'd give it a little peck here What a there. fun farm. I love it. It's very sweet. I love it. I there. love it too. Yes. Yeah. So guys, we have social media. We do. And the two main ones that I'm going to tell you about are Instagram. Mm -hmm. And you can find us at Sugar Coated Murder on the Insta. It's a great place to visit us. You should follow us. And also on Facebook. We have a group page that is called Sugar Coated Murder Podcast Fan Page. I did it all mm -hmm. the words at one did. time. I got all the letters. I don't know why when we set it up like that, we put so many words in it, but 
Whatever. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, email us. We love email we from get, our fans. We can't get enough email, y'all. We, we really can't. We Did you see we got an email this week from Lauren? Yes. And she sent us a, she had gotten a bottle of 19 Crimes wine. Yes. Oh, I love it. I, I thought just, that was hysterical. She said she thought about us. Well, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you think yeah, about alcohol us? alcohol and crimes. Why wouldn't you put those two together? And, and say, if I'm not mistaken, oh, I think that label is interactive some way with some app that you download. And the face makes a something and it's, it's really neat. It does things? It does things, That's yeah. That's cool. And then you find out about the crime. Oh, fun. Yeah, so, I mean, we might just get a bottle and... Just interact with it. I mean, I'll drink it. I, I know you're well, not I'll take a big... one for the team. I, I will take one for the that team. Sugar. So good. I appreciate I'm, I'm that. happy to help. I know. So, guys, um, stay sweet. Don't murder. Oh, let's just plug what's coming up for us. Um, I didn't give them the email address. Oh, well, could you? I would, <laughs> I would like to give them that because well, we said we want not? email. So let me give you that email address so you can actually yeah, send me. You might want to make a note of this because she may never give it to you again. I might not. Murder.sugarcoated at gmail.com. <laughs> Always getting into my business. <laughs> oh, and don't forget that you, if you have the Alexa app, I don't, keep seeing the fans will come on. Um, if you have the Alexa, if you have Alexa in your home, can Alexa you say, please, can you say her name <laughs> 10 more times? And then you go into the A word app and you go into skills and you type in a search for how to slay in the kitchen. And then you'll see our how to slay in the kitchen. And it's us. It's, it's me us. And, Anne, and you add it to your skills. And then every day you ask her to play your flash <laughs> briefing. <laughs> you play your flash briefing and then she will play one of us giving you a tip, a little kitchen hack. Give me an example. Give me an example. What's a tip? What's a tip? What's a tip? I'm going to tell you um, a tip. There was a pickle trick this <gasps> week. Tell me about pickles. And the pickle trick was that when you run out of pickles... Save the jar of juice. You cut, so you save the jar of juice. You, you take a cucumber and cut up either slices or spears, however you like your mm-hmm, pickles. Mm-hmm. You put them back into the jar with the juice. Oh, yeah. Close the lid, put it in the, um, and you can even add some onion if that's what you enjoy. Whatever you want to pickle. I do enjoy a little bit of onion. I do too in my pickle. Yeah. And so, and then you put it back in the fridge and 24 hours later, you got pickles. Isn't that smart? And there's your pickle I trick. love it. I love a pickle mm-hmm. trick. I know. So that's just one of the many things that um, you can hear. And, and it's a daily. It's a daily Every day. Thing. Every, Every day. day. It's day. One, and it's one of us. So um, I wish that people would do that because I think it's really do it. fun. Do it. Do it. And then let us know. I mean, post on the fan page every day. What's the, what's the hat? What's the, what's the yeah. slay in the kitchen? Listen, because day. you might learn how to cut things with dental floss. You might. Come on. Who doesn't want to know that? A lot of bananas at one time. That's the truth. That yeah. right there is the truth. It is the truth. So there's lots of things, lots of fun things that we've done a lot of research on. Yes. So that's another thing that you can do. And aside from that, we freaking love y'all. We do. Thanks we for y'all. listening. Thank you for listening. Oh, one more thing. Oh, one oh more just thing. one just more. One more. Next week, I'm very excited to say that we have a, another Slay in the Kitchen episode. Yes. And we got another slaying victim. We did. We got another victim. And he turned into a slayer. He did. I actually he think his slayed it. His result looked better than ours. I know, but you don't have to say that because I'm the one that made it. Oh, but no offense to you. I just think we used the I gave you the wrong pan to use. That's yes. what I think happened. I think that if you had had a taller pan, it would have looked different. Yeah, well, it was a dark pan. I should have adjusted it. It was a dark and stormy pan. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I should have adjusted the temperature, but his turned out incredibly great. So I'm looking forward to that episode, and I hope you guys are too, because I think you're going to be shocked at who actually comes on and cooks with us in that I know. episode. Shocked. It's you're shocking. Be, it's shocking. Shocking. Yes. Yeah. So. What else? Is that it? You said just one more thing, and I'm no. hoping you're going to stick to it, because I am T-I-R-E-D tired. Me too, guys. So we're going to bid you adieu. Stay sweet. Don't murder. Because if you kill people, we will talk about you.
Now listen to our new outro. Yes, stick around. Don't turn it off early this time. So professional. You are going to love it. And guys, bye. Bye. Take it away, Jared. This has been Sugar Coated Murder Podcast. A deliciously entertaining true crime podcast. Like what you heard? You can always explore past episodes by visiting sugarcoatedpod.com. Don't forget to like our Facebook fan page and share with friends. Thanks for listening to Sugar Coated Murder Podcast. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube. You know when you're listening to a true crime story that has an unbelievable plot twist that makes you stop in your tracks? That's what our podcast, People Are the Worst, brings you with each episode. I'm Rachel. And I'm Rebecca. We're identical twins who love true crime cases that make you say, didn't see that coming, and we hate the people responsible for them. Listen to People Are the Worst now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.